today's podcast, we focus on coaching cues. And in our world of virtual Zoom clinics and digital, digital information everywhere on our game, we have the ability to learn a lot. We can learn a lot more scheme. But ultimately, our job as coaches is be able to get on the field and coach our guys up and make them better in all the schemes and all those things we learned. And a lot of that comes down to having great coaching cues or the things that you say to your players that are going to help them improve. And joining me today to discuss that, the tight ends coach at Army West Point, Matt Drinkle. Matt, always great to talk ball with you. Hey, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Keith. Matt, we're going to get right into this. And and as I mentioned to you before we got going, I've really been focused myself and some of my writing and research and looking at you know what what do we do with all of this how do we make sure that with all this knowledge we're bringing in that our players are placed perfectly within the schemes we put them in that there's a lot that goes to this to the skill utilization uh, the types of bodies they have their skill sets as well as the skill development and so today goes to a focus on the skill development and for you, as you told me, you look at it in three areas, the classroom, the field, and the game, and the different ways that you're going to communicate and coach your guys. So let's start with the classroom portion first. And when you look at uh, just overall the things that you're going to communicate, how do you like to structure your terminology? And, and for you, is you know, what makes that up? Is there a, you know, a glossary for you that you refer to or things that you're going to teach these guys at the beginning? Um, because I do think it starts there before you take it anywhere else. So talk to us about the structure of that. How do you do it? Yeah, absolutely. So there's really, you know, I guess it'd be, if you can compartmentalize all of it, and that's really what I want any listener to take away today, is that there's really one stage of preparation and then three stages of application. Okay, and everything I'm going to talk about today is really about how to get your players to effectively execute uh, at a really high level. So the prep work is all the stuff you do with your staff in the off season, but as far as having a plan to get ready for that upcoming season, right? So the prep work would be, you know, assessing your staff. Do you have the knowledge and time to teach what you're going to do? And then assessing your, you know, not only your staff, but your players, who are your best 11? What do those kids do? Well, I talk about that a lot, but then I, I'm a big believer in a, in a pretty simple formula is that comprehension plus confidence equals high levels of execution. So again, confidence plus comprehension equals execution. So getting, so what is the best way to have that done? And really like you, like you had kind of led off with is there are three areas of the, that the prep work leads to that you have to not only teach, but you have to execute in three different areas first. So the classroom, how you're teaching things when you're in install and, and meeting, then when you go to the field for practice, and then in game. So those are really the three separate uh, separate pieces. But the the one of the biggest things I've always done that I really really like is I think, and I just believe this. This is my own opinion. Yeah, I, I see a lot of playbooks. You know, if you if you get your hands on some old school playbooks and they mm-hmm. put everything in there possible. Right. You know, they're not really to me. Like I, I've, I'm not a very smart person uh, and I'm not a big sit down and read books guy, but like if you could read a textbook or a comic book, I don't know that anybody wants to truly sit other than like huge nerds wants to sit and like read a textbook over and over and over again when you could just read a comic book. So that's what I've really gone to as far as playbooks. So w- with playbook, I want things in there. One, one of the biggest things I think when you go in a classroom is there has to be dialogue. That's the absolute best kind of teaching um, because it's, it's a fluid moving parts. You're not teaching something rigid like math where there's finite answers. It's about you and another person or a group of other people solving problems. So when there's dialogue between the two sides, that to me is the best learning environment in a classroom. So to me in my playbook and with assignments, I try to get everything cut down to one to five words, no more than five words on an assignment. So that way it forces you to, ha- to for the quarterbacks or the, the offensive line, the running backs, every position, you should have a guidance as a coach, but then you should have to have dialogue with that person who will change. It might be a first year starter. It might be a kid that's never played that position before. It might be a kid who's 
it's his third year returning as a starter and he knows it inside and out and you have to have a different dialogue with each one of those players as far as how to get them to uh, get their level of comprehension at the point that it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to, to me, go, go ahead. Well, no, my question is, uh, and, and maybe you'll, you'll get there with this. You did mention the word confidence, right? And so when we, when we think about our room in, in football, there's constant turnover every year. There's new guys in our room. Uh, so the confidence level between, that guy who's done this now with you and is, is a senior, he's done it all four years, versus that guy who's walking in as a freshman is, is much different. Um, and it adds a dynamic to it. So my question just really was on how does that fold into this too? And if that's something you were going to get to, we could hold off on that. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's really important because there's a couple different ways to do it. Like there's no one coach that has an answer for it. But to me, one thing I've done that I've always believed in that's, that's I think, like you said, like learn – that's led to a lot of the comprehension piece is I've tried meticulously throughout my career to build a a system that is really assignment uh, uh, simple so that there can be a great deal of scrutiny put on the technical aspects of it, if that makes sense. So um, I don't want a kid to have to run a base play that he has to remember it's blocked this way versus an over it's blocked this way versus an under that changes if there's a big, you know, if there's a, a gap pressure and it's blocked a different way versus a bear and it's blocked a different way versus a tight front. So if, if you can get it, your rules for things and same thing with quarterbacks, like, you know, if you, if you have a system that's really complex for a quarterback that looks awesome on a board and it answers a million problems on a sheet of paper, but the kid can't learn it. The player can't learn it and comprehend it. He's not going to have any confidence when he goes to, when he goes to execute the play. So to me, it's it, it, the, the more simplicity you can have with the assignments, you can really, really focus on fundamental play. And I, I think that's, you know, I, I get asked this question more than anything else in my whole career now is, well, now that you, you know, you're not an option guy, you're, what have you learned the most about working with an option offense and with coach Munkin? And, and really it's not about the offense. It's about coach Munkin. You know, it doesn't mean he can coach, you know, air raid or option or pro style football doesn't matter. His, his belief is on fundamental football and you know, he and I see everything eye to eye as far as the simplicity of the assignments to get it. So the execution of the fundamentals is really high because that kind of fits that mold, if that makes sense. So to me, if you can have it, so I'm not, I know who I have to block and now I can just get a bunch of reps of how to block them or, or whether that be a route or whatever, or progression for a quarterback, that to me is the most important critical aspect when you're talking about classroom learning. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. And it goes back to, for me, coaching the quarterbacks, but it's something, you know, I learned, I, I had to be mid-2000s, and started picking up and learning from a Dub Maddox, who I think has done a phenomenal job in putting together his whole thought process, which you get into it and you look at it on the surface level, say, wow, that's really complex, but he simplified it. And he, he likes to equate it to an operating system on a computer. Like you're going to plug in all this different software, but the operating system is going to remain the same no matter what you do. And so when you put the focus on the quarterbacks that you're always going to have this part of a route, which you will go to first, and then you will go to this one second, you will go to this one third, et cetera. That works better than saying, oh, we're going to use this type of read on this type of play, and then on this play, it's going to be this type of read. And it, it still could be that if you can set your operating system up for that simplicity. The same with what you were talking about. Making it assignment simple starts to create for that player the consistency that they need uh, to really learn a way to communicate both with you and for you to get that feedback. That, that's, a, that's a phenomenal way to explain it because I think that's exactly right. The, the, the operational piece is, is so important. And you think about it, you, what are you trying to get them coached to do? Like you said, like, uh, you know, with repetitions and consistency, you want it to operate like a machine. I mean, that's, and that's what they do. So to, to me, that's the, so again, the, the preparation part is, is all kind of pre-planning. And then the, the, the first mode of the attack would be the classroom. And the second part would be how you're coaching and your cues for on field in practices. Mm-hmm. So let's let's break down the, the classroom a little bit and maybe look at some 
practical examples, whether that's, you know, right now I know you're coaching the tight ends, but could really be from any position you coach, uh, the, the way that communication is going to work, right? Classroom uh, is definitely a, a different um, maybe style and tempo than what happens on the field. On the field definitely is going to pick up the, the different stresses of the game. So uh, I think the manner in which you communicate is going to be a little bit different. So for you, how do those things work? Well, the, the biggest thing is that for, from a classroom, you have to understand this. When you're coaching a sport, it is drastically different than teaching. Okay, When you teach a class, some kids can get A's, some, kid can, some kids can get D's or F's, and it doesn't matter to the teacher. When you're coaching football in a classroom, you have to present the material so that every kid's getting as close to an A as possible, otherwise everybody suffers. So that, that comprehension piece of it is so, so critical. So to me, that's where you can be when you're in a classroom, you can have open dialogue. You can be, I think that's the, that's the only scenario. I shouldn't say the only scenario, but that's where you can be most critical as far as, uh, you know, being able to be a little bit more aggressive in the teaching style, because you can, you can open that up, that communication, have that back and forth with each other. So you, once you can get the assignments out of the way on the front end, it's kind of a, like an evolution process. If you think about it as you, you can go assignments first and then move towards um, uh, more of the technical or, or fundamental pieces of it. Yeah, so in, in looking at that, thinking of of your, your guys in the classroom, I heard, man, I remember back to when Urban first took the job at Ohio State and he was addressing the, the Ohio High School Coaches Association. And, uh, you know, I, I was so impressed with what he was talking about and having this this on edge mentality in the classroom that he didn't want his guys to necessarily feel comfortable all the time that they were going to be challenged mentally in the classroom so that um, everything they were doing there, all the work they were done doing in the classroom to learn to comprehend, you know, when they got out to the field, it, it became easier than to physically execute because they knew it there. So, you know, looking at methods for doing that and every guy has a different style. So you may run your room, you know, differently than four or five other guys down the hall run theirs. Uh, what's your room look like, and what has been the best for you? And being able to give them those cues that, uh, you know, on this assignment, this is what you need to do. This is what we're seeing. Uh, how do we get there? Well, I can tell you one just to piggyback on what you're saying. Coach Meyer came and spoke to our team here at West Point last year, and he is as good as I've ever seen in a classroom setting, as far as how dynamic he is with hitting points and engaging the audience and, and very matter of fact and incredibly professional. So it, it was not once that was the first time I'd ever met him or ever see him communicate in that facet facet. And it's no wonder why he's had so much success everywhere he's ever been. So, um, but I mean, my, I think you, you have to be really a, a, like without giving out a specific exact way to do it. I think the biggest thing is to be really authentic. I think a big problem in coaching, especially with younger coaches, is they, they have mentors or people they really look up to and they try to emulate how that person teaches or that environment. Um, and to me, you have to be really authentic rather than authoritative. And I think that makes a huge difference. And I think about, you know, when I was going up through college, the two really good programs were Ohio State and USC uh, with Trestle and Pete Carroll. And to me, those programs were run – for out, you know, from the outside looking in, completely different, as opposite probably as you could ever be as far as how they went about their business. And I think that's so critical is that there's a lot of ways to have success, but the, it's being authentic that is so absolutely critical to the, to the teaching point of it. So for me, you know, I like that, you know, I, I do things that I, I try to teach in the classroom in a very comforting and envi uh, friendly environment for those the, the kids I'm teaching. So we listen to music in my meetings. Uh, I try to be brief rather than too long. I try to make sure that I don't talk, uh, you know, as far as like giving out the information very long. I want them engaged. I want them presenting. I want them having to talk. Uh, I want to be able to shift gears. So I don't, you know, if I can move quickly between points of maybe it's formations then maybe it's movement, then maybe it's run game, then maybe it's pass game or pass protections and be able to move pretty quickly so they don't get too stale because that's how their brains work and function. I think you can get a lot more done in less time now than you ever have because they have accessibility to information at all times. 
when you look at the the communication there versus what to, we're going to get to here in a second on the field, uh, how's it different in terms of the length of the feedback you give, um, and maybe even some of the the depth? You know, you you mentioned you still need to move things through. It can't become a lecture on just this one play. Uh, there still has to be some succinctness to it. Uh, so how do you accomplish that? So the, the classroom is incredibly different to me than on the field. So the classroom, like to me, if, if you're going to present, if you present the material, you want to have something that's really concise. I'd rather them walk out of that room knowing a lot about one thing than a little bit about five things. So one of the, one of the ways that I do that is just the presentation of the material it's, itself. So if you were installing power, for example, to me, I would give a general overview, basically stating, uh, you know, again, trying to be as brief as possible, but basically, hey, here's what I'm going to talk to you about. This is the this is the play itself. This is how it's uh, how it's applied in, in in the offense. This is why you have it. This is what it accomplishes. This is when you call it during a game. Then you go through. They'd physically see and read the assignments. They would visually see diagrams of it. And then you would fit, you would see uh, tape of it. And then you'd be able to stand up and walk through it. So you're, you're really hitting a lot of different learning models when you're in a classroom but, and trying to build together a, a, a full picture. But again, I'd rather do that really thorough with one thing than a, you know, rush through it or, or overdo it with five different areas. Yeah, definitely. And I know having seen some of your clinics and I, the one that sticks out to me is, is you really made an impact with your talk at AFCA and, you know, it was one that I think appeared on football scoop and just some of your slides done in a very memorable way. Is that an approach you take? Uh, I know specifically we're talking about, I think you and I talked about this before on the podcast, but you know, your Dwight, Dwight Schrute office um, slide, you know, to make an impact on, what you were trying to teach to those coaches, how much did that get carried over to what you're doing in your classroom? A hundred percent, because that's, that's kind of my personality is, uh, you know, again, you think about something that's, that's memorable, that's entertaining, that's relatable content. I think that is as important rather than just, Hey, here's some stuff that was printed out on Playmaker 19 years ago that I've been, regurgitating the exact same way forever. So I think that it's, it's very important that you're always constantly trying to find a fresh and dynamic and like I said, just relatable way to get content to the, to the consumer. And, and before we move on, have, have there been any new um, pieces of technology or, or anything along those lines, innovations in that way that have made their way into your classroom? Um. I think just uh, you can be so much more efficiently uh, efficient with how you are pre combining the material now, if that makes sense. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can combine different forms of technology or learning styles so easily now. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'm a big believer. I think one of the things that's going to end up coming out of this, I'm a huge believer in it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And I think right now with Zooms, there, there are so many people that are figuring out what you do, learning about what you do, and not enough people about how you do it, which is why I'm so excited. We're taking, you know, kind of spending some time talking about this. Well, it's always the, it's always the difference. Uh, I, I've seen it happen all the time. I, I, I've talked about it on this before, just in, you know, when I was recruiting for college, going out to a Friday night game, and you'd see similar teams of similar athletes doing you know they, they could have shared the same playbook with some of the concepts they were doing but one was superior and because you could tell they just knew how to do it they had all the secrets the details the coaching cues etc that go along with it so um, I guess that leads us into the part on the field right now we get them out on the practice field you know we've developed that confidence we've developed that comprehension in the classroom the, the field's got to move. We don't have time for guys standing out there and giving dissertations on what you should have done on this particular play. You're going to have to have certain coaching cues. You're going to have to talk about it in a certain way. You know, I, I sent you uh, one we did earlier on just uh, intrinsic and, and uh, or internal and external coaching cues and how those work. But for you, uh, what are some of those? And, and again, we could point to any time in your career or in any position, but uh, some of those ways you're going to set up those buzzwords and the things that uh, are going to make a difference to help these guys now comprehend 
both the physical part of this as well as we're going to, we'll assume they have the assignment part, right? If not, that's very easy. You've already said, you've set it up in, you know, a few words that that can be communicated, but now it's the physical aspect of it. And it's the decision-making aspect of it that come into play. Yeah, absolutely. So this is where, again, the second part, if you, if you think about like the, the, the attack part of the, the comprehension or you're trying to get to the execution. So you got the classroom, you got the field, you got in game field meeting practice it is a as different of a learning environment and teaching environment for everybody involved so one of the things i believe in wholeheartedly is you want your coaching points to be one to three words okay and and you need to have a, a physical setup on the field so that players that aren't physically taking the rep are visibly observing the rep and i think that is a, a an incredibly overlooked aspect uh, of on the field stuff. I think it's so easy. If a kid's not physically taking the rep, he's out getting water or talking to somebody or doing something. But to the point where I even have, you know, like the, the pods of the position groups back behind. So all the tight ends are together. All the quarterbacks are together. The, the, all the tackles are together. So that if a coach is having to make a coaching point and we're all seeing the same thing, it's all being seen by the same people the same way. So one to three terms in a coaching point or coaching points, you want absolute buzzwords. And to me, the two things you have to be able to get that you have to get accomplished during on field practice is one is critical adjustments. So you have to have like those three, one to three words, those buzz terms, those cues have to be for critical adjustments or decisions for kids to make or, or technical corrections and then situations. So everything that you run play-wise is impacted by down, distance, field zone, hash, time, score, uh, and the defense by itself. So to me, the situa- everything that you're doing is situational football, and you have to coach how that play's functioning based on those situations. So is it a, are you doing a first and 10 series? Are you doing a possession and 10 series? Are you working third downs? What's the down and distance? Are you working, uh, you know, just a million different scenarios? Like one of my favorite things that we do here at Army is we have an analytics company that gets us certain scenarios that we have to do. So we do one period a day of just a certain situation that might be a little bit more heavy on the teaching side, but it might be last play of the game, four seconds left, need a touchdown, the ball's on the 12-yard line. That everyone understands what – you have to get that scenario coached up. but. Uh, you know, the, I, I'm also a big believer in two two speeds when you're on the grass as a teaching speed and, and game speed. And, and really that being the only two that you probably need. Yeah, I, I agree with that. With, um, with that then in um, being able to communicate with those guys, ultimately, uh, maybe you see that guy. Now, you've used the same buzzwords with him two, three times. Do you have any uh, approach for – all right, this isn't working now. How do I redirect this guy to get him to do what I need him to do? Well, I think it's an easy, a couple things from an assessment tool that are really easy is one is the longer you're having to coach on the field, that that is your first sign indicator. You have not done it well enough or effectively enough in the classroom because it should be, I, I should take that comprehension level and now put it out. And now my physical comprehension needs to match my mental comprehension. So, the, so you know, there's a couple things. Is that two easy things? One, if it doesn't look good, it isn't. So after so long, you need to make sure that, that you know, don't lie to yourself and say, you know, I consider myself a, a very knowledgeable person on certain aspects of football. But if it doesn't look good, then that's my value as a coach right then and there. So I have you have to constantly rework to solve problems and troubleshoot all the time. And then the second thing is, and I, you know, I was a kinesiology major. So when I, you know, you kind of learn about coaching in a weight room is like when a kid gets done with a set, he should receive some kind of feedback, whether that's positive or correctional. And I think reps are the same way, you know? uh, So that's, that's where you can give those, those, those brief pieces of feedback and it shouldn't have to be assignment based. It could be technique based or, where your eyes go, something physically based in the feedback that they get that makes a big difference. Yeah, I see so many video clips, watching drills, again, stuff all over the place, and, and the coach in the drill, 
you know, the feedback is good job. Good, good. <laughs> you know, I tried to instill this in my son, uh, when he was young and, and he got it out of his system pretty quick. You know, I'd pick him up from practice. Aiden, how was practice today? Good. Nope. I, I want to know why was it good? What made it good? You know, and really making him understand that if you are going to get better at something, you need to comprehend that, oh, that was just good, right? We got to get past that. We have to find the specifics. So, um, and, and I can't remember who it was, you know, recently saying, you know, if, if my mom could give that same coaching point from the stands, then it's not a coaching point, right? Uh, I think that's yeah, a that's good a way, great, to me- a great way to phrase measure it. it. Uh, I can't remember who that was, but it, it was in a recent podcast. Um, you know, so for you, what, what are you looking at in terms of the feedback I'm going to give for that drill? What are going to be, you know, the buzz, buzz types of buzzwords that you hear from me? Well, I mean, it, uh, acute and applicable. You don't want something that doesn't help solve a problem. So it's like you said, good job or anything along those lines that doesn't move you further along. You know, I, I always saw like uh, one of the great ways to do it, to find out uh, either coaches or kids is uh, there, there's that thing called the, like the centipede walk where if somebody lays down on their stomach, you, you can do it and you're on your team in groups of, you know, whatever, four or five kids and they lay down on their stomach and they get in a push up position and they put their shoelaces, like the tops of their feet on the shoulders of the guy behind them. And then you have four or five guys doing that and they make a big centipede. And then you have one person who's coaching them to organize it. And you can see so fast that human nature is just to yell, come on, let's go get moving. But that's not coordinating anything. That's not solving any problems. And it's a really good tool for those kids to see. So one of the things you hear, you'll hear me talk about all the time, uh, like in staff meetings or with players when we get on the field, is I I, know, I want to avoid obvious lead, obvious leader guy. You know, somebody jumps off sides and somebody yells like "lock it in," or you know, get receiver drops the ball and you hear someone yell "catch it." You're like, <laughs> you know, that doesn't move anybody forward. So obvious. Uh, you know, observation guy is the absolute worst because he doesn't move. He doesn't move you and he doesn't push the cart any further towards the finish line. So to me, you just want really acute points. Now I will say this. One of the things I I think I've done a really good job of in my career is it's kind of like, you know, I I say this, I'm going to piss a lot of people off when I say this, but I have no kids. Right. But to me, it's like raising a kid. There's a lot of ways to do it right. There's only really a couple things you got to do to screw it up really bad. And I think <laughs> there's a lot of football that, that are like that. Um, so to me, it's not, you know, in pass protection or say you're taking pass protection, there's a million things you can tell a tackle on every play. But there's really only two things he needs to avoid to, to not get, you know, killed right away. You know, whether he's turning his shoulders really bad or stacking his, you know, his kick foot, whatever it is. If he can just avoid those two things, he's going to be in pretty good shape. So you have a lot of positive coaching points, limitless. So if you can coach the positive things and things that need to get done to get it better, as opposed to pointing out the one or two things repeatedly that are getting them killed, you know, that that's a big one. Yeah. Well, let's, let's move this from the practice field then to the game. Uh, now we add the stressors of the competition. Uh, the emotions of the game that get involved in this too. Uh, they come to the sideline. You know, there there does have to be sometimes that that calming force. Sometimes there has to be that you know that little bit of a kick for them too. So, uh, approach to the game as far as delivering coaching cues. So the game, I think, is the 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 last final piece, right? And I think that that is, if I just had to make an overgeneralizing assessment. I would say this is the area where people coach the, the, you coach the players the least from a psychological standpoint. So to me is you have the classroom to get everything mentally loaded up. Okay. So that's on the, 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 the comprehension part of it mentally, you go onto the practice field for the physical repetition and comprehension part. And then once you get to the actual game, those two things need to be together plus the additional ancillary things that you're bringing as a coach to help create the culture. You know, Brian Kite talks about that all the time. That culture is the, it's the most overused word, but it's like, how do you get there? And you're reverse engineering. Culture is just a collection of behaviors of 
individuals. So to me, is if you have to coach the absolute hell out of what behaviors you want during games. So to me, games are the, the really effective people have routines that are very, very similar to their practice habits. Uh, it's all about instilling confidence and positivity and problem solving. So to me, if you can hit those, again, the routine, uh, instilling confidence, being positive, and problem solving. So, you know, it's easy. Like if you're in a foxhole in World War II and you're next to somebody, you know, somebody gets in there who's a medic and he's never fired a gun in his life, and all of a sudden he's in the foxhole with you and he's got a gun in his hand, you're not just going to sit there and dog the guy about not being a very good shot or not being prepared. You're going to tell and say whatever you need to that person to make sure that they feel confident that they can get the job done. And to me, I think that's how games need to be. And, and, and you know, like, you know, if you, if you look at how people prepare before the game starts, you know, I've seen, I've been a part of a million teams where kids are, you know, sit and listen to music for 10 hours straight or taking energy drinks or they tape their bodies up different. Like that, to me, that's insane. Why would you want to do something for the game different than what you're doing for practice? So it's, it's it, to me, that, that doesn't, that that's a that's a variable that isn't instilling confidence, which doesn't lead to great execution. So, once you're out on game day between the lines, I'm a big believer in trying to be as positive, and and instilling confidence so we can solve problems together, and then do a good job of piecing together the mental part from the classroom and that physical part of the execution from practice fields. So, looking at your own development as a coach in in this regard. And I know you've been giving a lot of clinics this uh, off season. I believe you have one coming up here Saturday at the Iowa Football Coaches Association right. clinic. Being an Iowa native, I believe is that correct? That is correct, Bettendorf, Iowa. That's right. So we have we do we do have that one coming up. Uh, I will share that link in the show notes. Uh, another place to catch Matt. What I love about you, Matt, is that um, you've taken not taking the approach of, uh, you know, when you go out in a clinic season and typically you physically go here, here, and here, you're around in different regions, you can give the same talk. I haven't seen the same talk from you twice now, and I think I, this will be the third one, and, and you have a different topic here as well. So appreciate that. Um, but for you, you know, as you're sitting in the clinics and you're learning something or, you know, reinforcing some things you've learned by hearing it from somebody else, you know, your your thoughts on some of the things you want to take in or even questions you want to ask about how do I develop the coaching cues for this? What's your approach and what would be your recommendation to, you know, our listeners out there again, who have have this flood of information coming in from zoom clinics, whether they're free or paid um, where they are getting all these, these details on how to run a certain play. Uh, again, this is all about being make, you know, being able to make sure that execution happens ultimately on game day. So your advice to coaches out there in that regard. Find uh, to me, it's an easy one is find, find people and teams that are doing things really, really well without uh, incredibly advantageous resources. I think that is the most important thing. So like one thing I always did when I was a head coach that I thought was awesome was when we went to the AFCA, I didn't care at all if my assistants went and saw any actual speakers. What I made them do beforehand was research and set up meetings, individual meetings with two coaches from random staffs at the convention and say, hey, can you know, basically contact them through Twitter or email and say, hey, I, you know, I would love to take you out to lunch. I'll pay for it. Um, I just want to talk to you about whatever. Maybe it's your pass protections. Maybe it's your vertical pass concepts. Maybe it's your red zone offense, whatever. And we've done a million, you know, research, whether that's division one, division, you know, FCS, D2, NAI, whatever it is, uh, the level of it didn't matter. We wanted to talk to people who are doing something really great. So as a result, what happens is, is, you know, you know, everybody says yes, because everybody wants to, you know, share information and, if you, and be told they're doing a good job and be recognized for doing a good job. So then when they got to the convention, they'd sit down and if you ask for 30 minutes, they'll give you an hour. If you ask for an hour, they'll give you an hour and a half probably. And, the, and you sit and you not only get really good information for you, you develop an actual, 
excuse me, you develop an actual relationship with somebody that's going to be sustainable. And then selfishly for me, you come back and I get access to all that information. So as a head coach, I benefited from it as well. Uh, so to me, it was a win, win, win. Um, but I would tell you, like, there are great coaches at every level all the time. And, and it's about finding those people that are doing those things really well. Um, and you never know when they're going to be. If you, any great coach that's doing something now, he was probably coaching at some point at a place you didn't care about. So find, <laughs> find those guys and see who's doing a really good job because some of those guys in the next five years will be sitting power five guys that everyone's going to want to get a hold of that you won't be able to at that point. So do some research and find out guys uh, that are that are doing a great job and and can give you insight into how they're doing it, not necessarily what they're doing. I love that advice. It's great advice. And, and again, uh, you can see what Coach has done here, um, first and foremost, on CoachTube. Uh, his clinic talk was just turned into a course, The World of RPOs, Defining, Building, and Implementing. And you can find that, again, there on CoachTube. It benefits Lawrence First and Goal for Pediatric Brain Tumor Research and Cancer Services. Uh, been an incredible job by all the coaches who got involved with that. And, and certainly I know, Matt, that uh, everybody on, on the Lawrence First and Goal side, I know John works down the hall from you, but um, those the, that whole team has been so appreciative of everything the coaches have done. So again, thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's one of the best things going on right now. And hopefully that remains a clinic that we can do annually and everybody gets better and everybody wins from that. That's a, that's a rarity in life. So hopefully that thing keeps going. You will be speaking uh, this weekend, the 27th at the Iowa football coaches association clinic. You can find that at ifbca.coachesclinic.com. What's your topic for this weekend? We are going to be talking a little bit about RPOs and combining them into an offense. Awesome. And um, I know before we go, um, recruiting is so important to you guys, and I know there's been a, a change in your recruiting area. So for our listeners out there, where are you recruiting right now? So I am now in the DMV area. I'm a little bit – we recruit nationally here at West Point, but I have uh, Jersey, Maryland, D.C., Delaware – and then I kick over to the Midwest, and I have a little bit uh, of South Dakota and North Dakota. So I'll be in the Northeast uh, going head-to-head -head against uh, the bad guys from Annapolis and uh, trying to get everybody to get, uh, that wants to and, and willing ready to come play for Army West Point. And I know the, the best way to contact you is through Twitter. Uh, you're a great follow, always entertaining as, as well as educational, but uh, your Twitter handle. Yep, hit me up on that. I would love to do anything if I can help you with football or you want to talk recruiting or anything along those lines. My uh, Twitter handle is just my last name, Drinkle, D-R-I-N-K-A-L-L, -L, with coach right after it, no spaces. Matt, it was, it was great to spend time with you again and, and uh, catch up a little bit here, talk some ball and share that with coaches. And uh, you know, best of luck as you hit the road recruiting, well, virtually at least, nothing physically on the road. Um, and get ready for the, the fall of 2021 at Army West Point. Can't wait, man. It's going to be awesome. Beat Navy. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five-star for it. Right? If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach. Hey, Grabowski.